Rainer, the virtual floor is yours. Rainer, sir. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thanks all of you for joining today. Um, my hope is to give you basically a primer on simulation modeling. So some of you may have uh, experienced um, uh, simulation on a project team. Uh, you may be aware of it, and some of you may actually have done some modeling work yourselves. But typically within the systems engineering environment, you don't see too much of it at this point. I think a good uh, indicator is just the number of presentations and the number of vendors that are at NCOSI events that represent this, um, this industry. So we're trying to help change that. Uh, we're very active in a couple of local regions uh, that are very uh, interested in simulation and introducing simulation as another tool in the simulation, uh, in, excuse me, in the system engineering toolkit. Um, just on my background, I just want to highlight uh, one thing. Uh, this idea that simulation is an art and a science. I, I absolutely believe that's true, and I, hopefully you'll uh, get that as we go through here. Uh, the science would be the, uh, as a colleague called it, the clicking and clacking on the keyboard that, uh, that allows you to build a model, but the art is not only structuring a model, but also structuring a simulation project, uh, which can be uh, quite a challenge, uh, especially early on in the process. So. My hope is to give you some background on what simulation modeling is, show you some demonstration models in a variety of industries so you can uh, determine whether it's a good fit for some of the things that you're doing, and then also give you some information on other areas to uh, go for information. So with that, the agenda, I'll talk about simulation modeling in general. Uh, we're going to touch on multi-method modeling, which is a a uh, relatively new approach to uh, combining modeling methods within an individual hybrid model to take advantage of each of their uh, strengths. Um, I'll talk briefly about how simulation modeling applies to the SC experience areas, and I'm going to take a, a stab at uh, trying to link those. Uh, obviously, there's uh, uh, lots of opportunity for discussion around that. Uh, depending how timing goes, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about simulation model data and its preparation for a model. And then, as I mentioned, we'll go through kind of other considerations. So let's start with the defini uh, definition of simulation modeling, because one of the challenges that in our industry we run into is that there are many other industries and uh, tools and approaches that include simulation and modeling in their title. Uh, as an example, um, uh, simulation in healthcare, if you walk into a hospital and say, can you point me to the simulation lab, you'll be looking at some place where they have uh, physical and electronic simulators that uh, surgeons use to practice surgery. That's not what we're talking about. Um, if you're talking to somebody in the military about modeling and simulation, uh, or in aerospace, you might often be talking about simulating, for example, the flight cockpit or some actual physical system uh, using a simulator, and that's not what we're talking about either. Uh, in my definition, and there's a ton out there, uh, this is the one that I think that really um, kind of encompasses what, uh, what we're all about, and I won't read it in detail, but I'll point out a couple things. Uh, one is that we're talking about dynamic models. So these are dynamic models that take time into consideration and they also take variation into consideration. They're both mathematical and logical. So these are not models, for example, that are modeling the physics of a particular process, although in some cases that could be a component of one of our simulation models. We're talking about models for existing systems. So if you're doing troubleshooting or, uh, or trying to do some analysis on an existing process, or we're talking about new systems as well. And the purpose for doing them would be, obviously, analysis, visualization. So uh, 2D and 3D visualization is typically part of this class of tools that we're going to talk about. And then uh, if we get down to the, you know, the analytics description, um, being descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, so simulation modeling applies to all three of those areas. And where is it used? upfront requirements definition in the design and analysis of a system or a process, uh, daily operational management. So 
uh, a model could be used to, uh, to schedule today's uh, and prioritize today's um, uh, planning schedule, for example, based on today's current conditions. Sales and marketing, uh, a lot of organizations are using simulation. For example, uh, the material handling industry, when they design, or the auto industry, when they design a new system, typically a simulation model will be used to validate that the proposed design will actually meet the end requirements. And then finally for training, because we have a fairly, or can have a fairly high fidelity model of a system or process, it's really nice to be able to use it for offline training, especially for uh, models of dangerous or uh, difficult situations to, to put somebody in directly. Of course, I have to have my, uh, my quote slides. Um, and uh, I guess the, the important thing here is to reiterate uh, in these next two slides is uh, simulation modeling is not the be all end all. It's not a panacea. It's one more tool in your toolkit that can help you make better decisions. Um, and uh, as you uh, have heard and, and know, um, you know, models are not perfect. In fact, all models are wrong. Uh, George Box, uh, this is his actual quote. It's also been attributed to, uh, to an additional, uh, you know, sometimes they're useful as well. Um, it, so um, keeping that in mind that this is just another tool for the toolkit, um, let's talk about just some of the model types that are out there. <clears throat> Mental models. So um, how you think about a system or process, um, how in your mind you put together how something works as a mental model. We've got connected boxes. We have physical models and mock-ups. Uh, we have formulas on a sheet of paper, um, spreadsheets that include those formulas, and then we have simulation models. So lots of different modeling types. Why are we uh, even considering using simulation? Well, the typical approach uh, that often happens in companies is you have some type of a problem, and this could be, again, uh, an existing system, an existing problem, or an implementation of a new system and you jump directly from that concept or idea into the solution. Uh, often that leads to problems and now you need to uh, back out and make a course correction. So wouldn't it be nice to have some type of a sandbox to play in that says, okay, let me develop a model of my proposed system and do some what if scenarios on that in that safe space, in that risk-free space. And so that model, can be, as we talked about, lots of different types of models. In our particular case, we're talking about a dynamic simulation model. So now I use that computer-based dynamic model to play what ifs, to look at different scenarios, to conduct analyses, and then optimize the solution that eventually gets implemented. So a dynamic simulation model is an executable model. And by that, we mean that um, as the model runs, it's going to step through time. And at each step in the process, it's gonna be changing conditions, just like a real system does um, as it operates through time. And that state will then transition from one to the next state to the next state. And what we're interested in is what are the performance characteristics and the observations of how the system is operating at each of those state changes. So what we do is we build a computer model we drive it with a series of inputs, we run the model through time, and then that gives us a, an idea of at various points in the process, wherever I feel like stopping or wherever there might be a critical decision point, I can look at key performance indicators for the operation of that process. So as you might guess, <clears throat> the most popular modeling tool is Excel. Um, what we are talking about here is, uh, is when I show you some demonstration models, we're talking about general purpose simulation modeling tools. So these are applicable for any industry that you can think of. It provides the basic building blocks for putting together a model and representing a system. So typically, you know, a spreadsheet is a great place to start. And even folks that are transitioning into simulation modeling typically will have come from a spreadsheet. And that's great because uh, a large bulk of any simulation project is actually pulling together the data. So we can start with the data uh, that's been developed through somebody that's using a spreadsheet. But this is an analytical solution. 
So we have a series of formulas, maybe some scripts, maybe some code, maybe some specialty mathematical functions. And maybe that works. Maybe the number of parameters are, are manageable. Maybe the behavior um, is linear. Uh, the dependencies may not be too complex and they might be pretty clear. Um, but what if you have a lot of parameters? Uh, what if the uh, behavior is not linear, but rather nonlinear? And you have a, a series of influences that contribute to how your system operates. What if there's time and causal dependencies? And most importantly, what if there is variation in the process, so uncertainty or a stochastic process? And a stochastic process, actually, uh, virtually any process that you can think of is going to have some level of, um, of variation, especially if there is a human in the loop. So just briefly, let's, let's talk about uh, the classic bank teller problem. Uh, so in this case, um, let's say I have an average customer arrival rate of 10 customers an hour. I have one teller. The service time is five minutes. And I really just want to understand what the queuing behavior is. And from that information, I can do a lot more uh, analysis with that. So yeah, I could do this with, uh, with a formula, with Excel. Uh, it'd be pretty straightforward. But already you can see that I have some limitations. And so this standard formula only uh, applies to a Poisson stream of clients, meaning that the arrivals um, are independent with a constant rate and the service time is exponentially dis distributed. Okay, so this would be a good start if I wanna start doing an analysis of my uh, bank teller. And that ind independent arrival, that's fine. Uh, for an, that's a good assumption for a bank. Uh, but this idea of an exponentially distributed service time is really not valid. Uh, what you'll find is something more like this. Uh, for example, a bimodal service time where quick, uh, quick steps in the process uh, would be uh, this, this uh, curve here and more com complex track transactions would take longer. So if that's the case, well, now I need to start adding another formula. And what if I have more complexity, like there's more than a single teller? Again, with the assumption that this is still just a Poisson stream and an exponentially distributed service time. So very quickly, this very, very simple model of merely a bank teller is getting very complex and there's really no uh, mathematical analytical solution. And what happens if we add more complexity? So just some examples that, as you've experienced in your own bank, you know, you have multiple employees, you have customers that are moving uh, around uh, customers that are hopping between lines, picking what the shortest line is at any point in time, and employees with the different skill and training levels that have to be incorporated into the process logic. So the analytical solution doesn't exist. And what we're leaded, uh, led to is uh, simulation modeling. So let me just jump in real quick and I'm gonna just show you an example of a simulation model. Uh, first in a couple of different industries. So. I'm gonna start with kind of a manufacturing approach. And uh, so uh, what you're seeing now is a, uh, a general purpose simulation modeling tool development environment. Uh, I'm just gonna, we'll dive into a little bit more detail later, uh, but right now I'm going to uh, run this real quick. So what you're seeing are, are live runs of the model. It's, this is not a, uh, that's not a video. So in this case, what I have is a, a robotic palletizing system that's bringing boxes in, stacking them onto pallets. The pallets have sleeves added. Uh, AGVs move the completed pallets to a uh, finished goods area and move empty sleeves back and forth. And you can see, um, it's kind of small on your screen, but up front, I have the ability to control the number of resources in my model. So the number of AGVs, as well as the arrival rate uh, for the packaging line. So let's just go ahead and run that. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, a 3D view. I can also uh, pop over to a 2D view. So I can see my incoming stream of boxes. The robots are moving into a palletize there, uh, uh, filling the pallets. I'm gonna speed up the model real quick just to get uh, uh, get some product through the system. So now you can see the um, 
the uh, AGVs beginning to move. And one thing I want to point out is what you're seeing is a, uh, a guided vehicle network. So just as you would in a real factory that uses this type of a system, there's going to be some defined network that they move along, and there's going to be decision points and nodes where they'll be having uh, uh, decisions on collision logic and things like that. So the, the animation is interesting. Uh, you know, you can go to uh, any level of detail that you'd like on on how um, how how high fidelity you'd like to make this look, but actually it's the underlying statistics that are the important thing. So we're going to go to the logic and statistics. So on the bottom here, you can see the, the statistics of interest. Um, so one of the things that we're looking for is the time that a load is waiting for an AGV. So this could be an indicator of service time, for example. Picking robot utilization, so how often, how busy are there? AGV utilization. Utilization will be a key metric I'd look at to say is, do I have uh, too many or too few of a particular resource? And then I can start paying, uh, playing with some of the parameters, uh, changing them and see what happens. So this is a very simple example of, of a simulation model. So it's, in this case, it's a manufacturing process. I have an animation component and I have logic and statistics. And all this is custom built. So what I can do is make sure when I build the simulation, uh, the metrics that I'm introducing, for example, are the metrics that are actually used within the operation. So you're talking the same language. And so as you, uh, as you start doing an analysis, the results are in a common uh, framework that everyone understands what the outcome of the simulation is. So let's talk a little bit about multi-method modeling. Uh, so the model that I showed you um, uh, is a discrete event, basically a discrete event simulation model, and, and we'll go through that in detail. But let's start with system dynamics. Uh, so a system dynamics modeling paradigm uh, is a high-level modeling approach looking at system-level information. Uh, typically, it's uh, not typically, it, it is um, uh, consisting of stocks and flows and feedback loops and kind of differential equations that, that define the relationship between different things um, and how things move around a process. And it's looking at aggregated information. It's not looking at individuals, for example. Often it's used for things like marketing, um, uh, social dynamics, and, and uh, those type of applications. Discrete event, uh, the model that I showed you uh, this is kind of the uh, the bread and butter of the simulation modeling industry. It's been around a long time, um, and it's based on queuing theory, very process-centric approach to modeling. So you have entities or things, widgets moving through a process. Uh, they may need uh, some uh, some fixed capacity resources. So, for for example, uh, when a part on that previous model is being picked up by the robot, that robot can't do anything else at that time. It's fully dedicated to that box that's coming through the system. Um, and then we're looking at then the buildup of queues. So when something is occupied in that case, now things behind that resource are going to build up. And so that's uh, typically where you're going to be using uh, discrete event simulation. Then there's agent-based modeling, uh, a newer approach um, uh, calendar-wise. Um, and this takes a little bit different spin on how you model an object. And in this case, the agents have the ability to interact with one another. Uh, they can have their own independent, independent behavior, and they can interact with their environment. So one good way to look at it is for both system dynamics and discrete event, you'll typically know how the system operates. And what you're doing is drilling down and modeling the system so that you can understand the performance characteristics. But in general, you know how a system operates. With an agent-based model, you may have no idea how the system actually responds. A good example would be uh, tracking um, a, a disease spread or the spread of a flu within a metropolitan area. Uh, if you build that model, 
uh, you're building it at the lower level. You're starting with individuals and talking about their their susceptibility. Uh, what do the what do they already have? What are their interactions with family, coworkers, public transport, things like that? Uh, then when you run the model and you understand how uh, how how the flu is transferred or how the disease is transferred uh, through those interactions. The, the system behavior will emerge. You probably cannot predict what will happen up front. And so an agent-based model kind of looks at it from a different angle. So if we look at abstraction level on the left-hand side and kind of graph our three, uh, three types of modeling methods, so system dynamics is very, very high level, typically used at the strategic level, not a lot of details, Discrete event is going to be the other end of the spectrum. So typically, it will be very detailed-oriented, very specific times, very specific objects, uh, and we'll often get down into that operational level. And agent-based kind of spans both of those. So again, system level or system dynamics and discrete event, agent-based is more of an individual model. So you're modeling that lower-level agent and understanding how that behavior then impacts um, as it bubbles up and you look at the overall behavior of all agents in the system. So SD models will be aggregated information, whereas the agent base will be disaggregated. Typically, an SD model will be continuous, where uh, discrete event and agent base will be discrete and continuous. And what this means is a uh, dis uh, discrete model time jumps from event to event, um, whereas a, a continuous model, think of it more of like a, a, a continuous batch processing in a, in a food operation, for example. Stocks and or, or flows of, of product moving uh, constantly. And then finally, uh, stochasticity. So uh, typically an SD model will be deterministic, meaning that you're not going to include variation in the analysis whereas discrete and agent-based give you that capability. And if you take that same graph and look at how the models are distributed by, uh, by application, you can see how, um, how we get from that high level to the low level. So, you know, market and competition, social systems, uh, ecosystems, typically that's the realm of the system dynamics model. Down at the, at the bottom end, you know, physical control systems, computer hardware, and this means the flow of information, for example, um, and bandwidth uh, calculations. That would be a simulation model used at that lower level. And then uh, running the, the gamut in between. And of course, in any of these applications, you can always dive down or uh, lift up higher in the abstraction level as necessary. And typically, that's the way we, we conduct any type of a simulation project is uh, we'll start with as highest level possible model as we can to answer initial questions, and then drill down to more detail where necessary. So just a kind of a brief look at, at the three modeling paradigms. Um, so SD models uh, back in the, in the 50s, um, kind of the, one of the first uh, founders was looking at uh, segregation. So um, uh, this is the Schelling segregation model, to example. So in this case, we're talking about a classic vast diffusion model, which looks at uh, advertising and how a product matures through its life cycle um, as it's sold. So, for example, we've got potential clients as one stock uh, and future uh, purchasers as another and the sales process in between that's governing the transition from one to the other and influencers like sales from advertising, sales from word of mouth, the adoption rate, and the contact rate of people. So a good example of a system dynamics model. As I mentioned, a discrete event model is more of a uh, flowchart-based approach. So we have a, a very pr the, the actual uh, constructs and objects in a model look very much like a flowchart. So we have entities moving through the system. We have fixed capacity resources. We have queues, and we build in delays, and we have all kinds of uh, logic that's defining what's happening in the system. And then finally, agent-based. So in this case, uh, you know, I mentioned looking at um, the, the spread of disease. In this case, I might be looking at um, something related to how the population ages. So in this case, I could have a very large number of agents that represent 
every single person in the country or in a state. Um, they could have their own unique behavior where they're passing and transitioning through a state chart uh, from one phase of life to another. And then within each of these, they'll have some decision points that drive how they move within an environment, for example. And then they interact with their environment as well. So which approach should you use? Well, you know, up until now, it's, it's using kind of the traditional tools for the traditional problems. So there is a group of people that are dedicated to doing system dynamic modeling, and they'll typically use uh, only SD tools. And discrete event, again, has been around for a long time. It's, it's typically taught in universities and the industrial engineering or uh, operations research programs, and so you'll see a lot of DE models. But if you've got things like active objects, uh, and you have things that relate to kind of individual behavior, you might find that an agent-based approach would be uh, a good method for modeling that portion of it. And most specifically now, uh, in the last, I'd say, probably five years, as things move towards autonomous behavior, whether it's vehicles um, or people, politics, whatever it might be, uh, we're finding a lot more uh, uses for agent-based modeling. And the great thing is um, it's possible to mix these approaches. So within one model, you might use all three approaches and just for a specific modeling uh, section, decide what is the most efficient for that particular part of the model. And so the great thing is, as I mentioned, that you can, uh, you can combine these. So just a couple of examples. Um, what I might have is an agent moving through the system. Let's say it's a pedestrian uh, that is moving through a downtown location. Um, but when they get hungry, they're going to have the same process that they use every time. Maybe people will have similar processes for deciding what's for lunch. So I might have the autonomous movement using an agent-based approach, but my decision logic for what should I do right now might be best represented with a discrete event model and vice versa. And the other thing is what you're seeing here is models running within models within models. And so now we have a hierarchical object-oriented approach to, uh, to design. So we're incorporating kind of best practice software engineering into the simulation modeling tool. Let me show you another example. <clears throat> in this case, this is a product delivery model. And I'll, uh, in this case, I'm just gonna jump into a tool uh, quickly. First, I'll run the overall model. And um, you'll see <clears throat> this is a delivery of product from three manufacturing facilities. There's actually four on the system here right now. Um, so what you're seeing is uh, the red are manufacturing, the green are distribution centers, and the vehicles that are moving along a road network are delivering the product from one to the other. And the interesting thing about this particular model is one, it's incorporating an, incorporating an open source GIS network that defines the, the, the possible path that a vehicle takes. So now the time that it takes to get from point A to point B is based on the vehicle speed and the route that it takes. The other thing is that the model is dynamically uh, generated from an external table that contains the location of the various facilities. So if I go over to the statistics, and the other thing you can see on there is, uh, let me just hop back real quick to the animation. I also have the ability to change the fleet size uh, dynamically through the animation itself. So if I was, if this was, uh, if I was the process owner of this uh, of this system, uh, you know, of, of interest to me would be fleet utilization. Gosh, Nashville seems really low utilization for that fleet, so I'm going to reduce the number of trucks and see what happens. But that impact would be seen in this service level. So this histogram is showing how long the distribution centers need to wait for a product. So obviously, as I decrease the number of vehicles, this wait time is going to go up, and I need to understand you know, what are the requirements for my specific service level. And up top, you see the, the manufacturing process saying this is the production rate. But let me just briefly go into the application itself so you can see how a model is built. Uh, typically, any general, any current 
kind of uh, popular general purpose simulation modeling tool is going to have a drag and drop interface as well as a scripting language. So drag and drop to make it easy using pre-built objects and then a scripting language to add more detail and um, that allows you to customize as necessary. And we'll just start with the simplest process which would be um, Oh, I, uh, let me add this here, my process modeling library. So uh, the, the simplest process would be uh, something comes into a system. Let's think about our teller model, for example. Uh, it's going to get in queue because after the queue is some type of a delay, and then they leave the system. Very simple, traditional process. It's often called a server uh, in the simulation world. So you can see within each of these blocks that I've connected, I have a series of things that I need to enter. So what's the capacity of my queue, for example? So I'll put that in there. What's the delay time? So in this case now, I have a Java string that's telling me um, exactly what the uh, delay time is as far as a distribution function. And then if necessary, I can add more details down at the lower level. So that's basically how you build a model. And then you also add in the custom animation, uh, you know, pulling in CAD files or map files or things like that. But the other thing I wanted to show you on this particular model was, uh, which, which is really important in any simulation model, is how I get data into and out of the model. So in this case, you can see I have a, a table that defines the distribution centers and the manufacturing centers. I'm going to delete the Kansas City uh, location, I think. That's not letting me do that. And now if I rerun the model, you'll see the model is configuring itself on the fly. And uh, I'll no longer have that Kansas City production center uh, that's in there. So uh, the interactive uh, nature of the simulation model with the data, you'll see that the Kansas City location has disappeared is really important. And especially these days, you've probably heard the word digital twin. Arguably, almost any simulation model can be a digital twin. And the idea of a digital twin is that it represents a system, a system's current configuration, so that you can have an exact replica to whatever degree you, you feel you need exact of your real system. But what that means is that it needs to be able to, at any time, pull in the data that represents the status of that real system. And so data connectivity is really important when we talk about digital twins. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll argue that not every simulation model is a digital twin. It's only the ones mm -hmm. that do have the connectivity uh, that, um, uh, that allow you to understand the current configuration of a system. Ready? One second. My uh, cursor is not letting me stop this model. All right. Uh, so I'm going to jump through. I've got a couple other demos we'll, we'll run at the end. I just don't want to run out of time. Um, actually, let me just do this one real quick uh, because it does apply within systems engineering. We have a lot of defense folks. Uh, a very, very simplistic model that incorporates now kind of autonomous movement. Um, and this is a very, very simple model of an air defense system. So what we're looking at is, um, is the, uh, some of the parameter settings for an incoming wave of uh, aircraft um, heading towards a target. And so we're looking at the volume of aircraft, their speed, their altitude. And on the other side, on the deterrence side, we have missile speed, uh, we have uh, radar coverage parameters, um, as well as the number of uh, concurrent missiles that a, a radar installation can handle. And so this gives me the ability to start playing with uh, some of the parameters and then looking at basically capacity to system in this, in this case. And I can also take some unique views and perspectives out of it. But again, the animation is really more uh, 
the eye candy, it's the underlying statistics that are really the driver for the for most uh, simulation models. All right. So briefly, if we look at the systems engineering experience areas and how simulation modeling might be applied, and again, this is just my first cut at where I think it's appropriate. Um, you know, in requirements engineering, you could be using simulations to help develop those operational concepts being done in a lot of industries right now, uh, performing a system analysis, assessing alternatives within the architectural and design development phase, preparing for the integration, so using a model to help with the actual integration activities. Again, kind of preparing for the verif verification and validation. Supply, acquisition and supply, just the example that I showed you was a good one. So preparing for, can I supply my system and do I have the capacity? Analyzing technical risks, looking at life cycle costs, et cetera, et cetera. And just briefly, one more quick uh, demonstration that focuses on autonomous movement. Now I realize I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, kind of manufacturing type models this can be applied in any industry and is uh, applied in any industry you can think of. <clears throat> but what I wanted to, to highlight was the autonomous movement in this particular uh, warehouse example. So in this case, what we're dealing with is uh, some type of a production process. Uh, items are then moved by autonomous vehicles to uh, locations that could be an automated storage and retrieval system. It could be an area where I have operators involved in the process. But the important thing is you'll notice that these vehicles are moving in autonomous space. Uh, so they're not being told where to go, they're being told where not to go. So they can't go through the walls, they can't collide with each other, they can't run into these other solid objects. Other than that, they're on their own and they have the ability to move from one place to the other. Because now the engine is inside of that AGV, uh, that's that's uh, defining what it's doing. And the beauty of that is now I don't have to put in decision rules, uh, rules about collisions, and I could preempt this, this, um, this AGV at any time. So this robot on their way from one point to the other could be told, I'm sorry, you have an emergency pickup, stop what you're doing, go someplace else. In a traditional discrete event model, you'd have to wait until they actually got to a decision node to be able to make that type of a decision. And again, like all the other models, you'll see um, statistics. In this case, typically, they would be uh, various states or uh, uh, a breakdown of, uh, of waiting times and things like that. So uh, I'm actually going to skip the simulation model data. Just you know, briefly, uh, you'll, you can get this presentation. Uh, but what it'll do is uh, describe for you how a uh, how you take actual data uh, and where that data might come from and how it gets put into a simulation model. Um, and I'll just go real briefly, you know, we have an example of a, of a blood test turnaround time out of a clinical lab, for example. So in this case, you have a series of, of, of times uh, which produce a histogram, which then you use a best fit function to determine what the best fit um, uh, distribution function might be. That's the thing that you use in your model to represent the real system. So every time there's a blood test, a random number is generated, it's bounced against the distribution function, and now you get a different value that's statistically valid compared to the original data set. So that's how we incorporate simulation uh, data into the model. Um, and some different types of distributions and their typical uses within, uh, within a simulation. And I'm going to hold off on that too, but I did want to get to some other considerations. So with today's simulation software, um, it's progressed uh, a lot since the, uh, the, the, the basically the, eight, the, the late 80s when I was first introduced to it, things have changed a lot. So now there is a, a, a much easier user interface. So as I mentioned, drag and drop capability with the ability and typically with drag and drop, uh, there has to be a lot of assumptions made. So you want to be able to bypass that and you write your own code for 
unique things that may not be part of a standard object. Industry-specific custom templates. So for example, for material handling, uh, there's tools that are focused on healthcare. Uh, you might have uh, a fluid type. You might have uh, you know, different uh, industry-specific templates. And what those are are just pre-built objects just to make your modeling life easier. And typically what you can do is, is take those custom templates and then create from those your own specific template for your company or your application. With the larger computers, we now have a lot uh, stronger um, capability to run models quickly, uh, to build them and compile them quickly, and have very complex models, including very complex 3D animation. And this is, to me, this is the, the fourth bullet used throughout the system life, life cycle. This is the most important for, for me as a simulationist. It's ideal, typically what happens is you have a project conducted, a model is built, an answer uh, is uh, generated, and then it gets put on the shelf. It's such a shame that the model is not used continuously and stays matching with the system configuration through its life cycle because you can always go back to that model and reuse it. And there's quite a few simulation applications out there to choose from. So as you look at, at um, software, here's some of, the, some of the criteria you might uh, use if you're looking um, at selecting simulation software. Here's a list of some of the tools that are out there. Again, just a partial list, and I've broken it down by the, uh, by the modeling paradigms. And then finally, uh, the tool is the one thing, but the other would be uh, you know, key success factors. I normally, when I teach this as a class, I've got four pages of these key success factors. We don't have time, so I pared it down. The biggest mistake we see is people investing a lot of money into a tool, a lot of money into training, and the poor person that is tagged with that responsibility now has to go solve the largest process in a company, the biggest issue. It typically fails, and now simulation gets a bad name. So uh, we always recommend start small, get that early win on your belt, use it as a pilot, use it as a learning exercise. Have a really good scope. Uh, you know, scope creep happens everywhere, but especially within simulation projects. These assumptions that you make up front are really, really important. So typically, we develop a formal simulation specification. And then target the lowest fidelity level possible, and even hierarchical, as I mentioned before. Start modeling at a really high level, and then drill down where necessary. Uh, you may find through some sensitivity analysis that building a detailed model of one particular part of the process at this point is not critical because that's not where the bottleneck is or will be. Uh, make sure that you get uh, all your constituents, all the stakeholders, part of the validation process. And um, as you do, consider who's going to be using the model once you've completed it. And then finally, almost most importantly, develop that believable baseline. Typically what you do for a modeling project is you develop a baseline model, and then that's what's used to generate uh, lots of different scenarios. If your stakeholders don't believe that the baseline model represents the existing system, no way will they believe the results that come out of these scenarios, especially if they're counterintuitive. And then finally, there's, uh, there's some societies that are uh, specifically focused and have large constituents that are that are doing simulation modeling, the Institute of, of Industrial and Systems Engineers, um, SCS, uh, INFORMS, which is the Operations Research Group, and there's quite a few conferences. In our industry, the Winter Simulation Conference, uh, which will be in Maryland in December, is the big annual conference for us. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed paper conference, uh, but there's other conferences as well. And then there's tons of on -time, uh, online materials whether it's books or um, LinkedIn user groups, uh, videos, YouTube videos, et cetera. And there's my contact information if you have any questions. Uh, and also, if we don't get to your question, if you have one today, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, just one quick model, uh, final model, a little bit different. Since we're talking about completing this here, we're going to evacuate our webinar. So in this case, this is a evacuation model um, for uh, 
for evacuating a facility in, in a fire. Evacuation, evacuation models are used uh, in a lot of different areas, ships, facilities, buildings, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, you can see now we just have normal operations. People are coming to work. Uh, you can see the time here, it's eight in the morning. I'm gonna just speed it up a little bit to make sure that I have a full office. Now I'm gonna trigger the fire alarm and boom, now I'm starting to see um, how many people are inside the building? How are they moving? And you can see they're all moving independently, uh, evacuating the building until it's empty, and now I have my duration of evacuation. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrew and ask if there's any questions that I can answer. But Reina, thank you for a great presentation on simulation modeling for systems engineers. I'll look through the questions now. And first one I have is from Sebastian Sanchez. Do these tools, uh, for instance, AnyLogic, allow for interaction with complex dynamic models, maybe in MATLAB or compiled from C, C++, Python? Uh, so uh, absolutely, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's one thing I forgot to mention. Uh, so, um, and I can speak for any logic, but I think in general you'll find similarities with uh, a lot of the general purpose simulation tools uh, that they will have some type of a hook to be able to use uh, and interact with other applications. We have an open Java API, so anything uh, that also has a Java API allows connectivity. Um, I know uh, there's been discussions with MATLAB about, um, about connectivity. And one of the most exciting things for us, and if anybody's interested, there is a, a webinar tomorrow being sponsored on the integration of artificial intelligence with simulation. So basically the AI community, uh, as far as we can see, hasn't had a lot of exposure to simulation modeling. Most of their modeling is done in Python. So what we're doing is we're creating objects that allow um, AI folks, for example, in reinforcement learning, to create a simulation model that, that can be used to train and test their algorithms. And part of that, um, that objective is then that we need to build a, a better Python hook within any logic. So that's in work right now. So in general, yes, most of these tools have really good connectivity with other systems, including complex systems. So we have no more questions on the list. So it, here's your opportunity to the audience to ask more questions. We'll wait a minute and see what turns up. While we're doing that, I'm just going to run uh, a couple of other models uh, real quick. One of the things that I didn't show was um, optimization. So one of the things that you can do with simulation is, um, is optimize on a particular objective function. So not, not only can you determine what the system performance is, but you can say, of these parameters that I have the ability to select, what's the best combination that produces the best result? Um, in this case, we have a, uh, and actually, you know, I'm gonna, I'll show you the, the baseline model, which just shows um, the, the simulation running. This is a credit processing, so more of a business process um, that shows people in the process. So we have incoming orders, uh, we have a certain number of bank clerks, security specialists, analysts, and it shows kind of the queuing, how many orders they'll get done, things like that. And I'll just speed it up real quick. So what I can now understand is, okay, do I need to add more analysts or uh, change the process somehow? But I can also optimize. What's the right number of uh, individuals to have as far as the mix of skills? So I can run an optimization experiment and focus on the greatest throughput. And you can see I'm, what I'm doing is I'm mul running multiple replications of this simulation model over and over again until now I find that my best solution has three bank clerks, nine security specialists, nine analysts, and the eight consultants. Uh, and that gets me the best results on the, uh, on the objective function. And this, the, the throughput, the, I'm, this was not throughput, this was time, so the quickest time to get something through the system. So just another example of, uh, of a simulation model. Um, any other questions, Andrew? Yes, I have one from Joshua Philgate. Any suggestions for modeling of system performance and requirements? 
<clears throat> it shows up on one slide, but there wasn't much discussion or guidance. What tools to use, how, advice, anything? Anything is helpful, thanks. Uh, gr great question, uh, and I'd probably lead, need more detail. Um, um, you know, part of it would be understanding at what uh, level, what stage in the life cycle of the system are you looking at? Is it, um, is it more in the conceptual stage, more for understanding what, you know, like conducting a trade study to select a specific concept, or is it down at the more detailed level? Um, and again, these general purpose simulation modeling tools are employed in any industry that you can think of um, and any process that you can think of. So if you're thinking about doing something, there's probably somebody out there that's done it already. Uh, so I'd suggest reaching out to me. The other would be just do an internet search on whatever process you're talking about and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and add simulation modeling to it, and you'll probably find uh, a winter simulation paper, an example model, a video of something like that. Uh, but without more details, I really can't, um, can't give you some guidance. We have a question from Leonard Provoid. Can any logic model RF waveforms and or communications? Uh, no, you typically would not use any logic for that. Um, you might use it in an abstract level, and if you could abstract an RF uh, signal to some set of characteristics where the performance of another parameter is the thing that you're really focused on, but the actual physics of, a, um, of an RF uh, signal would not be appropriate. And a good example would be um, that model that I showed you, you know, the radar. Uh, we don't model the radar characteristics but we emulate it by saying, you know, did or did it not detect um, a, an aircraft using these very, very simple characteristics as opposed to the actual um, physics of how a radar interacts with, uh, with a moving object. It doesn't look as if any more questions are coming through. So thank you again for a great talk and thank you to the audience. Uh, for your questions and your time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Absolutely. The next slide shows our upcoming schedule. The next webinar will be held next Wednesday, Wednesday the 17th of July, when uh, Caitlin Kenny will give a presentation on professional licensing for systems engineers. Then uh, we break then for the International Symposium, and the next uh, webinar will be on Wednesday, the 14th of August, when Sarah Sheard will give a presentation on what systems engineers should know about software, part two. We'll have additional web web webinars that will be offered on the third Wednesday of each month, typically, through 2019. Please note, if you go to the website shown here, you'll see more information about the webinar series including a way to view the last 125 webinars, and soon this webinar as well. Next slide, please. 29th Annual and Cozy Symposium will be held on the 25th of July 2019 in Orlando, Florida. Details about the symposium, including how to register to attend, can be found on the Incosi website. As a next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, you can now claim one PDU credit towards your systems engineering professional recertification by attending uh, this webinar. You may also claim this credit retrospectively for INCOSI webinars that you have attended and where attendance meets the qualification requirements. Please contact INCOSI if you wish to know which webinars you attended and if you met the qualification requirements. Thank you again and goodbye.